I've been taking my time. I feel like I'm out of my mind. Hey everybody, welcome back to Project Made. These are G and Bree, and today we have John Spencer. He is a retired major out of the U.S. Army, uh, 25 years of service. Uh, thank you for that service, by the way. And he's been in numerous articles from. New York Times to the LA Post to USA Today. Uh, this man also has a book coming out and he will talk all about that book and then also about his experience when he went two tours overseas to Iraq and then also his family and work dynamic. I mean, this man is incredible. Uh, welcome, John. How you doing? Hey, hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm doing good. Life is good. Great. So, okay. We always ask everybody, how did you decide to go into the military? Man, that, that's a hard, I would say I was just from a hometown, Indiana, really out of high school. My mom signed me up at 16. I, I knew it was what I wanted to do. I didn't really have any other thoughts in my mind, but join the army. Wow. Okay. So you're in the army and, um, can you talk about a little bit of your experience um, kind of climbing the ranks and your deployments. Sure. So I, like I said, I joined out of high school at 17 years old, went straight to Panama. So from Indiana into Panama. Oh. Uh, so I got the full culture shock of not only joining the army, but getting to travel and see the world. Uh, I started off as enlisted. So what we say enlisted so the, uh, as a private, uh, I went to all the way to Sergeant first class and then decided to become an officer. So I, in about 2000, right before 9-11, actually, so in 2000, I became an officer, and then 9-11 happened, uh, moved to, back to Italy, where I had served as a as, as soldier before, moved to Italy as an officer, and then just because of right place, right time, I ended up being a part of the invasion force uh, into Iraq in 2003 as a brand new army lieutenant, platoon leader in charge of 40 soldiers. Uh, jumped into the northern Iraq, so it's a dream come true. Uh, uh, almost, you know, the the legacy of the greatest generation in the World War II jumps. So we jumped about a thousand soldiers into northern Iraq and spent a full year as an invasion force and all the complexity of that. Uh, after that, I I went back to Italy, finished college, actually uh, became a ranger instructor at the ranger school, which is another dream come true. Ended up going back to Iraq now as a little older, a little wiser, but as a company commander in 2008 of an infantry company, well, now 140 people uh, into downtown Baghdad. So I spent a year from 2008 to 2009 mm. in some pretty tough fights. Uh, met my wife, interestingly, in Iraq. Uh, mm. We were both soldiers stationed in a really bad location in inside of Baghdad. Met her and then dated after the deployment, uh, and then made a wonderful life. Uh, we ended up eventually, in part of our career, being stationed at the military academy, United States Military Academy, together. My last duty station, uh, neither one of us haven't gone there, but we ended up teaching there for four years, uh, and, that, and that was my last duty station before I retired in 2018. Wow. Okay. Well, so you talk about, you know, the dream, the dream of, you know, going overseas and fighting. What was the, you know, you went pre 9-11. So what, you know, the people that we have, we've had on the podcast have been post 9-11. Mm -hmm. So what was the driving force pre 9-11? Yeah, that's a great question. And I actually start my book off with this because we are shaped to think about what we think about the army, the, the wars, we all get shaped from birth almost. We don't even realize it. So I, I grew up in Indiana. My grandma went to the VSW and the American Legion and places like that. Cause her husband's a few of them that were all war II <laughs> veterans. Uh, so that was a staple of my life as a young kid was going and seeing these old veterans with the hats, with the units and, and the camaraderie they had. And I, I grew up on G.I. Joe, the A-Team, you know, all that stuff. Was, <laughs> but it was shaping my, what I thought about what the Army was supposed to be, what war was supposed to be like. Um, so that that's really what shaped me. And I knew, I was even the, in a little program called the Young Marines when I was a little kid. Wow. So I was primed, mm -hmm. primed to be, want to be in the military for a bunch of reasons. Uh, and I, I am the dream come true of what it, I, I 
I tell people I was reborn in the army since I was, you know, I ended at 16. My dad left when I was like six or seven. So I was raised by my mom and my two sisters. Really, when I entered the military, I was re-raised mm. on how to treat people, how to earn respect, how to gain respect, how to eat right, how to keep your body in shape, all that. I was really reborn in, in, in the Army, although how crazy that sounds. Yeah, so like, uh, you know, you growing up in Indiana, you know, David Goggins, I'm sure you know who that is, talks about, yeah. you know, right side of the tracks and left side of the tracks. Where do you believe that that's a thing out there? Yeah, I mean, I, I love David Goggins. Yeah, I mean, of course, I grew up very poor, very uh, mom working three jobs, trying to hold it together, three kids, never saw her. Um, Sometimes I, I thought she was having nervous breakdowns, but after having watched my kids for just one year while my wife was deployed, I can't imagine what she was mm -hmm. going through. But uh, I tell my wife, she actually, she actually just today, like you grew up poor, but kind of my spending habits now don't really reflect that. <laughs> uh, but I remember heating water on the stove to, to make bath water because the power had gotten cut off. Mm. I mean, it, it all shapes us like, like David talks about you, those memories, even the most horrible ones shape you who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is growth in that. And I'm a firm believer in that post-traumatic growth. Even now I have studied it. And I, I think it all shapes you and who you become. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. So now talk about, you know, you going into the, to the service and you going into, you know, infantry, you know, training and whatnot, um, you know, basic boot camp, and then you going into the first deployment. And then where did you become like special? Did, like, did you ever think about becoming special forces or what, what was the, you know, mm -hmm. you got a ranger shirt on. So I'm, I'm sure you, I'm sure you had some sort of, you know, uh, motivation, but, uh, what was, what was the thing for you? Yeah. So I, 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 when I was 16, I would go into the recruiter's office and watch these really cool, I forget what they're called. They weren't DVDs back then, but they're you know, these films you'd watch. VHS. The US. <laughs> no, they were, they were like. You know, Floppy like, disk? <laughs> no. I can't even remember what they were called. Like the laser disk. It was almost like, I forget what they were called. But yeah, v, let's call them VHS. But about Army Rangers, about Army Special Forces. And I, I actually tried to sign up to come into the Army like that. And there was a program. But of course, like every person who comes in the army, you know, mm -hmm. we sometimes recruiters are like car, use car salesmen. They, they gotta, <laughs> they're just trying to get you in that seat. Uh, so uh, the Ranger contract wasn't available for me. It was, you know, eleven X-ray or just basic infantry with an airborne option. Like, yeah, but you can go Ranger as soon as you get as soon as you get in. And I, I did that, got in, and never heard about it again. And was able to apply later. I, I knew I wanted to be a part of the Rangers from, from the day I, before I even came in, um, I never considered special forces really. It was just a timeline thing. And most people don't know, especially for officers. Once I became an officer, there's a very small window when they, we allow our officers to apply to go to special forces. Mm. So I was pretty much in Iraq during my window of when I could have applied mm. or I needed to, I needed to go back and finish school. Cause I, I did a program where I, I hadn't, graduated a bachelor's degree in college yet, so I had to go back and get that. But I was in the Ranger Regiment as a private. Um, great lifetime achievement for me. Then the fact that I went to Ranger School, which is different for us, you being in the Ranger unit, being in Ranger School. But then I went back, you know, like I said, as a captain and, and was a Ranger instructor. And I really, I even put that in my book. It's, you know, that little kid who watched those videos, it was almost self-actualization for me to become a, a ranger instructor and to be a part of that community. But it's a part of my, what I say now is it's a part of my identity. Uh, just like being a soldier is a part of my identity, being a, a husband, a father. Um, we all have multiple identities, but a ranger from early on has always been a part of my identity. Mm. So you said you were raised in the military, essentially reborn. And, yeah. and so you are thrown into wartime. Was it what you thought it would be like? Uh, absolutely. Uh, there, there, absolutely. And I, and I try to, in my book, I, I have a three part book, which almost didn't get published because that's not what people want. People want one narrative 
Uh, so I had a lot of problems getting my book published, but I really wanted to highlight a changing war where I deployed in 2003, jumped in like the World War II vets, you know, lived off our vehicles, very, what we call austere environments, you know, living on the side of a building, swimming in the Tigris, uh, writing letters home, <laughs> like, you know, crazy old school stuff, uh, writing on pieces of cardboard and, and sending those home at, at almost a post card receiving packages having mail call oh. it was everything that i had imagined and what i had read about and what i'd seen and it's forming the, the what they would call the band of brothers kind of what i call the band of brothers phenomenon of you know, being put in these really stressful situations of bullets flying and i try to tell some of these stories and it's actually when you come back that the bonding i think happens because you all had just went through some great fear causing event, no matter who you are, everybody experienced fear, Mm -hmm. but you experience it as a team. You come back and you talk about it. You you make fun of each other and it's, it's a form of coping. It's a form of processing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I write all about that and and that deployment with all its ups and downs, it was everything that I had imagined the war to be. Mm. You know, with your book coming out and I know you're, you're really in the forefront of putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. So let's let's put yourself out there. So uh, you know, rather be too forward, but uh, tell us about your own mental mental wellness uh, in that in that time frame because I'm sure there it, it was it was relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in 2003, my 2003 deployment, almost every system that we have in place, I think to to maintain a soldier's mental health during combat so we've been doing this for centuries we know that small unit cohesion is important and we know that uh discipline you know, training beforehand we know all these things are a part of what helps people endure combat in 2003 my biggest and i put this out there and i'm an open book my biggest mental issues were really not fear of dying not fear of the enemy, I had absolutely zero problems with that. The things that I found myself un- a little unprepared for was a little bit of imposter syndrome of you know, not wanting to fail in whatever the job I was given. Stop there. Stop there. What What is that? What is mm-hmm. imposter syndrome? If you can educate, you know, who's, who's listening that doesn't know. Yeah. So imposter syndrome is when you're the person, you're, the, you're you know, getting up to do a public speech to a group of individuals and you don't feel like you're the right person to be talking to them. You don't feel you have the credibility, the expertise. Maybe they, they probably know it better than you, mm. but you're standing there and you have an internal voice of, Hey, you're an imposter. You, mm. you should not be here. You're going to mess this up. It's a, it's a very common phenomenon. And, and a lot of people experience it. Some people can drive through it. Mm. Some people, it causes inaction, you know, state mm. right? Those things that, uh, and in combat, that's the worst thing for us is, not making the decision, freezing up, which I, I did see. Um, luckily, I never did that, but I wrote about that. That was always my biggest fear. It wasn't fear of who I was going to fight. I always felt that we were trained. Um, and in those early 2003, we were fighting, usually fighting other people wanting to fight us. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, We were going out to find somebody or we we're reacting to somebody shooting at us, things like that. Yeah. And the, the, the age of the IED, um, which I've written about, wasn't until the end of that tour. By, by the time I went back in 2008, there was no more bad guys really shooting at you or you know, you're you doing a big combat mission against. It was just driving around waiting to get blown up by an IED. Mm. Wow. And that's a, a completely different psychological experience mm-hmm. than, Absolutely. than basically entering a fight knowing that you're the better fighter. Uh, that's what we train people to do is enter fights and know that you're going to just dominate people. So what's, I mean, sorry to cut you off there, but what's the, what's the difference? What, I mean, mm-hmm. you, uh, us who have never been in warfare, mm-hmm. you know, so like what is the difference between going, knowing that you're going to see a person at the end of at the under at other end of that barrel rather than mm-hmm. driving in a Humvee, mm-hmm. knowing that you might be blown up any second. What, what, like dive deep in here. What is the difference for you? Yeah, it's night for me. It's night and day. And there's 
very little research. There's some research. We've studied the military. We know how to make, how to train people to move forward, disregard all human no- nature of fear and move forward and, and fight. And it's part of what we do. And that's the whole band of brothers theory, right? I'm not fighting for myself. I'm fighting for my friend to my left mm-hmm. or right. We all have heard that. And it's real. It works. It, it not only helps do that operation, but it helps people deal with what the horrors that are war, what you see, what you do. Um, war is a group experience. It is not an individual experience. It's a group of things. It's, it's, you're doing it with other people. Driving around in a vehicle waiting to get it blown up is an individual mm. experience. There's all, there's, you know, I could get into like the scientific aspects of it to where you enter a fight, your adrenaline's going to spike. You enter a firefight, all those emotions and the adrenaline and the training kicks in. You're sitting in a vehicle waiting to get blown up every day. It's just an everyday release of what's called cortisol. You know there's nothing you can do. It's literally a grim reaper roll of the, the dice. Mm. There's nothing you can do that's going to help you fight. It's not going to, you have no control. It's, it's, it's what they call learned helplessness. Mm. You're just helpless. Mm. And your buddy to your left or right can't help you. Right. It's just a matter of when the bomb goes off, did it hit you or not? Mm. Uh, and if you do that every day, and this is, I've written about, it's just not been researched. The last time we did like research that would really tell you what that feels like was really Vietnam. We sent researchers into Vietnam in like fire bases that are being attacked and we take their blood, we take their urine. Like we know what's going on in the human body in the combat experience. Nobody did that for Iraq and Afghanistan about what does it do to the human body and to the mind really to sit in a vehicle every day mm. and then maybe it's blown up every day. Maybe it's blown up once a week. Uh, it, it, I think is different than any combat experience in history. And, that, and that's, so I write a little bit about that. I also write about, um, you know, we're in a, we live in a new connected world. So that's really what the book is connected soldiers. Um, everything that we used to know about war was about sending people to war as a group. And they, they dealt with it as a group. They process it. You know, old days they used to come back on boats, take them months to come back. You know, you go to war today, like my wife did in 2018 after I retired, and I'm at home with, you know, an eight year old, a six year old, <laughs> and, a, and a three year old. But they could talk to mom every day on Facebook. You know, they could hand her an iPad every day. Hmm. And there's been a little bit of research on that may be good for the family and the soldier but it ain't it also may be horrible to the soldier downrange who's now not only dealing with combat yes. mm. he's dealing with whatever is at home mm. and now home is dealing with combat like they've never dealt with wow before. yeah uh, wow that's really interesting okay so in your experience then if you compare your wartime experience and you came home and you said and yeah. you met your wife in iraq on a tour so you were single essentially you didn't have your kids yet okay so you come home after combat what resources did you use or did you use nothing at all did you not reach out no so i'm i'm what they don't want us to be which is (laughs) uh bullheaded um and and i think a part of our culture and i think we've talked about this is is this idea of being strong Mm -hmm. um and, and that and even when I struggled, especially after my 2008 tour, which is psychologically very different for me because I was a company commander with a mm-hmm. lot of bad things happening, it took a mental toll on me where I almost, I think I had a nervous breakdown while I was in combat. Um, and I still struggle with some of what happened over there. And that's, it, because um, I'm always seeking to compartmentalize and just shove that emotion that experience deep down because I was raised from the time I was a little kid until the, especially when I joined the military of what strength is about mm-hmm. what is being strong and that that belief of seeking mental health assistance uh, even the term mental health it doesn't in the way I was raised or the way I thought about the world it wasn't part of that 
strong, being strong aspect. Uh, so when I got back, I just tried to process it as deep down inside. I, you know, I, I get nervous around crowds still to this day. I don't like it. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I try to, we, we call it resilience. We try to get back up to the, wherever we were before the experience and mine just happens to be the combat experience. But you, you try to get back up to a, a functioning level. Mm. Uh, a new, I, a new I, normal. Yeah, new normal, right. Yeah. So tra- trauma is trauma. Trauma, is, I don't care what theory is out there. Trauma is trauma and it hurts people. Mm-hmm. The, 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 now, how that trauma is addressed and how it's processed, how it's unpacked. I, I you, you asked about what, what happened when I got back. You know, So every soldier who leaves out of a combat zone has to fill out a questionnaire. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. if the questionnaire says, like, did you see dead bodies? Yeah. Do you have any problems sleeping? Do you want to talk to a mental health specialist? And the answer, and we all know the answer no on every one of those answers because if not, one, we're not going to get to where we're going. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just not the right time. Uh, or it's a sign of weakness that to our who we value, which is our group. It's a sign of weakness to our group. Yeah, and and you know you, I can't tell you how awesome it is to have you on this because you're so vulnerable and and, and you're stepping into a new masculinity that mm-hmm. that really hasn't been tapped into. You know, with with all we have of being macho and just shutting the you know mm-hmm. f up and and doing just doing what we do. And I really appreciate you you diving into that zone. So let's keep in that zone, and and let's say you know you're you're back. I mean, I don't know if you've had this uh, situation happen, but you're back home with your kids, and then your wife is out. Yeah. And you Facetime, but that Facetime doesn't get picked up. What are we thinking? What are we telling the kids? What, what have you been in that situation? What I mean, if you would like to share, I would really love to know what did you say. Yeah, and I, my kids might hate me for this later, but I put it all in the book. Um, I put the one. So this, my one of my biggest fears is just helplessness. Yeah, and that is actually goes back to combat training. We train e- e- EMTs, emergency services. We do as much training as we can to, to give them control over a situation, no matter how chaotic mm-hmm. people might think it is. There's this overall element of control, and I, I used to tell other people that one of my biggest fears of combat was just not having a weapon. Like that's a, that's a nightmare scenario for me because it takes away what we one of the things that we need, which is a feeling of control. So you got, you know, I got now I got a three year old baby girl, a, a five six year old girl, and a seven eight year old boy, and I'm at home. Uh, they start psychologically responding to the absence and the trauma of not having mom, not understanding why she's not here, FaceTiming her, but not talking to her, starting to say, I, I, I don't want to talk to her. Uh, and I'm just, I feel like I'm helpless because I can't control. And at one point, my actually my youngest started having a urinary problems. Uh, <laughs> one, I'm a guy, I'm like, Drink cranberry juice. What do I do? I, uh, 100%. I, I take her to the doctor, get her tested, nothing, and, and to find out it's actually a, a social emotional mm-hmm. trauma. She's, she's, her body's responding to the trauma. And that thought of my child having some type of mental response to mom not being here, or you know, this internet thing not working for her was killing me. And it was, mm-hmm. you know, compounding my own issues of not being able to control. And I was in a bad place a bunch of nights, actually. Wow. So what do you do? What do you do when you are in this space where you feel helpless, which is the, like you said, it's like the worst thing that can happen, especially how you're raised, how you've been conditioned, how you've been trained, you've been in combat, you've been the leader, and then you feel helpless, especially with your kids, which already you're going to be more vulnerable for. And so what do you do then? Yeah, so it's, I can't, I don't know exactly what the right answer is. I can say the things that help me. Yeah. Um, uh, because I think some of this is individualist, right? So one of the biggest researches on trauma is that 
usually people that have had previous trauma are highly likely to have re- a different response to trauma than the man left the right or the woman right left the right of I don't listen to music. I just don't. I never did. Even when I work out, when I'm in a car, I do audio books. There's only been three times in my life I've ever turned to music to help me with anything. And that's my 2003 combat deployment, my 2008 combat deployment, and when I was home alone with my kids. What were the music? What was the music? Yeah, I really yeah. want to know because I want to turn that on. Was it like gym. Rage Against the Machine? Was it like country? Yeah. Like what are we talking about? So – in 2003, 2008, and then in 2018, once the trauma, the mental anxiety is really what it was, mm-hmm. um, started to happen, I had to unload my mind with any type of, I have my go-to music, whether it's the Dixie Chicks Traveling Soul. That's music. right. That's right. That's Thank you. I love that. Anyway. <laughs> um, anything by Jewel, you know, mm-hmm. these the words almost didn't matter. It was the, it was the, the voices, yeah. the song, and everything, even Kid Rock's picture with Alanis Morissette. It, it calmed my mind. Uh, and it, it was personal to me and I've never needed music other than these moments in time. Mm. In mm. combat, I would actually put music in to sleep. It was the only way I could go to sleep. Wow. So at the end of the day, when I put my kids to bed, I found myself, just turning on music in headphones and just sitting there listening to it. I don't drink. I never drank my entire life. So it's just never been a coping mechanism, but there are these coping mechanisms. And the other thing that helped me, which I think my friend who, who runs a, a PTSD basically methodology um, called the path. It, it's a Boulder crest retreat where they run soldiers through this program is you have to be able to talk to somebody about it. Mm. Compartmentalizing doesn't work. But it, for me, it always had to be, I had to talk to somebody who I had the belief could relate or mm-hmm. could understand. Just talking to somebody who had no idea didn't work for me. So if, if it was about combat, I had to talk to a combat soldier, a veteran of it. And that's the moments of complete ease that I would have and what we talk about, th- these bonds that we form with people. But now I'm forming bonds with other parents in my CrossFit class <laughs> who for, for 10 minutes after the class I'm explaining the craziness in my own way and they're listening and uh, for me so physical exercise is the other thing right so it's mm-hmm. there's the music and if I didn't exercise every day and you know I'm not trying to channel Dave and Goggins but it, it, it's, it's just a chemical release of, yeah. of it's a part of my life and if I don't do it it really reflects in my emotions and my my patience with my kids, everything. Mm. And I completely I'm understand. <laughs> yeah. So it, so I combined, actually, I formed a different family in this. I, I rejected CrossFit my entire military career. <laughs> <laughs> those push, those pull-ups, man. Like, it's, it's weird. Tell me you I don't do those pull-ups. I do the pull-ups. Oh. I, do the pull-ups. Uh, I thought it was all fatics. I, I, I really looked down on it. That has no, the exercises and the movements have nothing to do with it. It's with, I met with a group of individuals every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you went through a little bit of a challenge, physical challenge with them, crazy, funny looking movements. Uh, and then I, it formed a bond with that family. And then I would talk to them about what's going on in my life. They knew that my wife was deployed. Um, they would ask me about it. Mm. Those few moments were enough battery recharge every day. That, that I was able to survive it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that that's amazing. Just, just how you're able to flip the switch. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure it took a long time, man. It, it wasn't just overnight, uh, the people listening. I'm sure it took a long time. And then you now transitioning into writing your book, uh, which I'm in the process of writing mine. I, it has, it, I'm sure yours weighs far more than mine does, but... Uh, uh, what was the transition? What made you say, hey, I, this is me. I want to share my mm-hmm. story. And I want you, the listeners or the readers, to take something away from it. What was it in you that you thought that other people needed to hear? Mm-hmm. Like specifically, what was it in you? So I've written for every major organization in the United States. I, I kind of, I, first I started as a goal. I've written for every newspaper in, in the United States. I've written over a hundred things. 
what I found through writing and before I even started the book was that it was therapy for me. Mm. Um, that knowing it was almost validation that somebody else wanted to hear what I had to say. Um, writing the book, though, was really a, a part of my therapy in releasing uh, and and the fact that I've thought about this for a little while, so I do incorporate some research, just, you know, forgive me, because that's what I, what I was trained to do towards the end was really ask hard questions of even this theory of what is strong. So I, mm -hmm. I really write about that. I still struggle with that as a, as a man. I'm treating my son different than I am my daughter. Mm -hmm. I'm telling my son, mm. be strong. And I'm telling my daughter something different. Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that, what that, what that actually means. So the books are released for me. Um, this book will be the most personal thing I've ever written. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've written some personal stuff in my articles, uh, but it'll be the most personal thing. Cause I think there's some questions that we have dealing with PTSD, dealing with the combat experience, dealing with this, this new thing we have that's, belief of that virtual will replace the physical. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that it does not. And I hope that COVID taught us that, that you mm -hmm. can't just go straight virtual. Yes. The human humans need social interaction and mm -hmm. we need physical reaction. And that, that all of that is, I'm, I'm just putting it out there on, you know, I'm questioning all this. This is my experience. Maybe somebody learned something from it. I, I messed up a lot. Mm. Probably more than I did right, um, and, and I, I'm honest about all that, hoping that it helps me getting it out, uh, mm. and, uh, and if it helps somebody else, that's an added bonus. No, no, truly, uh, something that you just said stood out to me. Um, well, I know we might be getting off topic a little bit here, but I, I grew up with all females, so by you saying, you know, you said something different to to your your female, you know people than that you did with your males like what what was it what what was that why was that so the, the, the it's you know, you're going so that that how are you going to raise your children is, is always the, the big question that isn't really a culmination of everything that you have done up to that point the values you have intrinsic in you the, the way you're going to do it and, and the, what i experienced in all all the hardships and what I've seen around the world in Iraq and everywhere, that universal thing is that we always want better for our children. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but there's no training to be a parent. So <laughs> have, there's no immediate feedback, right? So that the, in, in combat, the enemy will tell you immediately if you did something wrong, because in kids and in, in being a parent, there, there's no, you're just hoping you're doing the right things. Mm. I, mean, I was I was raised by all women too, so I was my mom. But my mom was, man, was she rough, uh, <laughs> trying to make me strong in her own way, uh, make us all strong. So it's it's everything in our society, it's everything in our movies, it's every, about the image of strength, the image of you know my girls. My my wife grew up as a tomboy, uh, so she has very strong feelings on what she wants our girls. Mm -hmm. to be powerful to what images they they want they respect uh it's it, it, it's just it's an everyday struggle right there is no right answer i i was very adamant because I, I want to do better for my my son about him being strong not showing emotion my wife comes in often going that that's not right like why <laughs> it, it it's okay if he cries. Yeah, yeah. Because you're you're showing emotion. You're literally showing emotion right now. So it's like, why do you want your son to not do that? Right. Yeah. I I have no. I don't know what. I don't know. <laughs> I, I in Iraq in my 2008 tour, my interpreter died. Uh, it, it was an older man. He was almost like a father figure to me. But I I escaped to my room as fast as I could because I was tearing up. Mm -hmm. It was crushing me, uh, and I couldn't do that in front of my men. I personally felt that I could not do. I don't know why. My mom died. Uh, I, I was a ball and baby for three days in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. I didn't care. In front of the other men, I could not let them see that I was being crushed emotionally, and I, that's probably wrong. And I don't know. And maybe if I write about it, people will recognize like that's wrong. 
Um, but let me ask you this. Sorry to cut you off, but let me ask you this. If your leader who you, you know, when you were in uh, in Iraq, like if your leader showed mm -hmm. the emotion that you're showing right now, if your leader showed the vulnerability and the, and the connectedness and, you know, a different masculinity that you're you, you you're used to, if he or she had shown you that, would you be more inclined to have he or she lead you if she, he or she showed that vulnerability side? Yes. Yes. It has to be actions, not words. I, yes. I, I, I really hate leaders that say, you know, it's OK to go see mental health. You know, it's okay mm -hmm. to do all this stuff. We, that's not the way we learn. That's not the way, especially in, within the tight groups, military, law enforcement, all this stuff. We have an entire system of uh, what we call norms, what the group says is okay and what's not. Mm -hmm. it, it's through action and not words that make a matter. And it has to be within this system of. So, in my solution to the, and what I think one of the issues with experiencing trauma in combat is that. Now we experience it, we come back and we connect online with other people. I think that's a breakdown in what we know works, which is we're sitting around a campfire mm. yeah. saying like, I was scared shitless yep. about I, that. And I talk about like there's a moment where I, we picked up a dead, one of our fallen, the medic hands me a pair of bloody dog tags and said, sir, what do I do with these? Mm. That is burned in my mind yep. to this day. And I look at, there is nothing that prepared me for that. Yep. I can pick up dead body parts of enemy soldiers because we've learned how to dehumanize that. Mm -hmm. mm. But that bloody dog tag of an, a U.S. soldier wrecks me forever. Mm. Uh, I should have talked to other people yes. at that time about that, mm. as in the people around me. Um, and that openness is what we've known we know it helps people survive traumatic incidences. When they talk to people, they respect. Mm -hmm. So if my leaders had brought, done this, this coping, this within the system, uh, being able to say, Hey, this messed me up too, or it's okay. If this, you're having problems dealing with what we just did or mm. what we just saw, uh, this connected world has, has almost broken apart some of that. And that's, that's going to cause a lot of problems, I think, in the future. So, no, I couldn't agree more. With you being so forthcoming uh, with with your experience, mm -hmm. what do you have to say to the next generation? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've all of us. You know, me being a fireman and and wanting the next generation to do better, be better and to know better and then you know her with you know being a female paramedic and then mm -hmm. coming up and wanting to mentor more females what do you have to say to the to the soldiers that come in with a with an attitude of i uh, i'm going to put my head down and i'm going to do it and then i'm you know i'm going to get after it and i'm going to i want to see war i want to do this do that like what what do you have mm -hmm. to say to that individual that that that's head down and and just you know, ferocious in, in wanting to fight. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's good, right? That's what we want. And sometimes we got to train that into people um, <laughs> where it, it, you enter in a system, we have this system and we all do with whatever our profession is. We have a system of the things we respect, the people we respect, the people that we look up to, mm -hmm. the things we're trying to climb the ladder in our own way, the military about things we wear on our chest that, that, Hey, you better respect you're going to respect this or um, what I would tell others is that's great. Uh, and they learn quickly that they are a very small piece of an overall chain. Yeah. Uh, so they can be as strong as they want to be, but it's about teamwork. And we, and we try to get to that in the military. Um, it's, it, but it, it ripples across the whole life. Uh, and this is the one thing that I think I needed more um, where we understand that fighting is kind of a group thing, but we don't understand that dealing with it all that is a group thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a crisis in the within the U.S. military about suicides to this day. They're, they're still out of control, um, and it's some of it has to do with the culture of you know this compartmentalizing, deal with it. What's strong, and if what's viewed as a weakness. The problem is that within fighting, we know that it's always group effort. Mm -hmm. 
everything in life is a group effort. Even me staying at home as a stay at home dad now, mm-hmm. uh, I don't see people other than the one group I see when I go exercise. I have to have somebody else to talk to. My wife comes home. She, you know, she's still in the army, lieutenant colonel, works insane hours, crazy days. She comes home. She says, she'll listen to me, but she didn't want to really hear everything. The, the overall message that has to get out is that nothing should be done alone. Mm. Nobody should, nobody should suffer alone. There has to be somebody to talk to there, whether that's somebody that experienced it with whatever it is with you. Um, if it's that moment, like what, what I'm talking about down range or when we, when we get back, mm-hmm. um, that's the human mind is we have to have a, a connection with somebody. We have to talk to people. I mean, I, I, I fall into traps even in my current life where I, I just don't see anybody. I don't talk to anybody. Mm-hmm. I, I drop my kids off of school. I come home. I, um, but it's those few interactions I do have to have to capitalize on and I have to make friends in my own way. So um, this internet social con- media helps maybe um, mm-hmm. if you reach out. But I think we have a lot of problems. We, we, we do in the military where people – go down this spiraling thing that it's just all them. And then they're having to deal with this. They, they can't recognize that they, even if it's not even asking for help, but talk to somebody else mm-hmm. in a mm-hmm. trans and not in a transactional way. And I missed moments like this. And, I, and I'll say I was a terrible leader because like you said, I was single. Mm-hmm. I didn't, ask, I didn't even think about what they had going on in their personal life. It was about the mission. Mm-hmm. And if, if they mentioned something to me, I don't know if I triggered that they were actually wanting to talk to me about something. And I, I, if I gave advice to people, those moments will come about. You won't even know they're there where somebody's actually wanting to, to talk to you about something. And you, you just went right past it and I mm. do it. So now I'm the person like asking you know, the, the coach at the gym after class. And I'm talking about life. Like I'm not, I don't want to talk about the workout. I, I want to share a moment with another human. Mm-hmm. Um, people go down this spiral and they think that there's nobody that they can talk to and that it's only them. And then they make really bad decisions about, um, it, that's, that's unfortunate. And I don't, there's a lot of people doing a lot of great work. I don't know how to change it, but, uh, it's something I definitely recognize is that nothing, even that charger, that hard charger coming in that wants to fight, nothing is done as an individual, not fighting and not dealing with trauma, life, war, nothing. You know, John, you said you didn't feel like you're a great leader because you've missed some of these things, but the whole point of being a great leader is to be introspective and you're really looking at things and you're being an example of what we're going to do. We have to talk about these things. You're showing vulnerability. Look at all these power, the power you've had, the accolades, you have it all. And you're sitting here saying it's about the human connection and it's about actually having a real conversation with people and connecting on a deeper level. And it's true, social media, all these things, a lot of it is fluff, right? A lot of it's on the surface. So I really appreciate you acknowledging um, just how important it is to get this message out, which is why we even do this podcast, right? I mean, yes, you can have as many badges as you want, you can be respected, but what it comes down to is those people can also be lonely. And we are seeing a huge problem with mental wellness in all facets of first responders. So I really appreciate you're just being very authentic. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you talked about uh, teamwork and, and, you know, being there for your guys and gals. However, rapid fire, buddy, <laughs> you are not going to be there for, uh, you're going to be by yourself. I'm going to tell you this right now. Rapid, rapid fire, fire questions. Rapid fire questions are going to be there right. by yourself. Here it is, my <laughs> man. You ready? You ready, Major? Yep. Yeah. I'm always ready. Okay. Right. <laughs> you, 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 you're a little finicky. You're a little, you're a little fizzy. Okay. Uh, I'm a, got a bum shoulder. I'm getting older. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. Well, well a bum shoulder. That's what, that's what we'll put it as. Um, so the rule is, Bree's going to ask you five questions, and um, you have to answer in one word or one phrase, all right? One word or one phrase. Okay. Are you ready, John? I'm ready. Um, okay. First question. What do you first notice about someone when you meet them? Eyes. Mm. Ooh, okay. Window to the soul. 
Okay. Uh, question number two. What is your least favorite MRE? Man, one, I haven't eaten an MRE in years. Uh, my least favorite back in the day is probably chicken noodle, which is a surprise to many people. Mm. How does that even, is there, how does that even come about? Is it, it's in a pouch or it's in a bowl? Yeah. It's in a pouch. In a pouch it's like a gelatinous mask. And oh. It tastes good and it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. No, definitely not. All right. Number three. Would you rather come face to face with a miniature hippopotamus or a giant cockroach and both are in a bad mood? One, I'm going to go with science. Hippos kill more people than any other <laughs> animal. I don't know if you know that. Oh, 100%. 100%. I'll, I'll take the cockroach. All right. This is why we gave you this question, by the way. Okay. <laughs> okay. Number four. As a parent, what is your least favorite toy that your children have had? Anything that makes sound. Yeah. Anything that makes sound. Yeah. yeah, no. Hard They're hard. already so uh, let's, let's go with the recorder because they get given that thing and they just come home and they blow on it. <laughs> no matter how much you tell them to stop because it's for school and they're just blowing on it. So it's the recorder. <laughs> Okay, last question. So what is one word to describe yourself? Dad. Dad. Oh. That's awesome. We haven't had that in before. We have. That oh. is awesome, man. Um, yeah, yes. It, it, I, when I retired from the military, it, it, was, it felt like a funeral, but I said I've had many identities in my life. Ranger, sergeant, soldier, leader, commander, none of them mean anything to me other than dad mm. that is or they mean something to me they don't mean as much <laughs> <laughs> let's clarify that yeah um yeah. no through and through man like your kids don't care i mean at the end <laughs> of the day care. they don't care they care about you being a dad mm -hmm. and you know your 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 wife being a mom and that's what truly matters and that's what we're trying to get out there that's what you're trying to get out there is you have to be a dad and a mom and a brother and a sister and you know mm -hmm. just whatever son daughter you have to come back to that basis when you come back from the war and that's what we're you know what you've implemented in your book and and are advocating and i truly res just absolutely am honored and i know Bree is to just have you here with us and sharing your story and your book's going to come out the link is going to be in the um, notes down below uh when is that coming out tell tell the people by the way so spring of 2022. Okay. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, it's driving me crazy waiting. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, brother. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure, and we can't have you. Uh, can't wait to have you back on. Uh, you know, when your book comes out, and see how see how it's doing. Thanks a lot. It's been a, a great honor, a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Absolutely, brother. All right, this is Project Mayday. Call out. Call out. I feel like